Thank you all for coming. Very happy to be here at the first LA Creative Pro user group of 2019. And we are very excited to talk to you about Final Cut Pro 10 and the latest version, which was released with some great new features. And before we get into this, uh, we wanted to take a bit of a look back at the past year because it's been a great one both on the software and the hardware side. So, started in December 2017 with our release of Final Cut Pro 10.4. Many of you probably remember that release included some great tools for 360 VR creation. Also support for high dynamic range workflows. Import, grade, deliver HDR footage and of course, uh, a fantastic set of advanced color grading tools, including color wheels, color curves, hue saturation curves. And then, just a few months after that at NAB, we released another update to Final Cut Pro 10, And that included what we think are the industry's best tools for creating and delivering closed captions, which we'll talk a little bit more about tonight. And of course, we introduced a brand new format called ProRes RAW, which combines the flexibility of RAW video with the incredible performance of ProRes. But to take you through uh, this great launch, uh, I'm going to invite Luke up to the stage, and he's going to talk more about it and show you uh, in person. Thank you. Thanks, Judd. Good evening, everyone. It feels like uh, it's been, I guess, a year. We're back here again talking about Final Cut Pro 10. And as Judd said, want to talk about some of the new features that we uh, brought out in uh, 10.4.4, starting with the comparison viewer. So this is a really nice tool. It lets you compare any two frames in your project, or perhaps you want to compare something in your project to uh, some kind of stock footage. It's great for color correction, matching, uh, matching effects, and so forth. We have an all new video noise reduction filter built into Final Cut Pro 10. Takes full advantage of the power of the hardware uh, and also the great performance in Final Cut Pro 10. This is a big one, literally. We have an all new large time code window. So we got a lot of feedback from people that said, you know, when I'm working with someone, I'd like to be able to see the time code. I want to have a nice big time code window on the screen. So now you have it. We have some new batch share uh, capabilities. So you can share uh, from the browser, so multiple clips or multiple projects all at the same time. We've added some functionality to our industry leading closed captioning support. So we now support the SRT format and we now have the option to also do uh, burn-in captions, right? So you can actually have uh, the captions burned in and visible all the time. And last but not least, a new workflow extension. So workflow extensions let us take terrific third-party tools that work with Final Cut Pro 10 and bring them right in the application, which is really cool. So I'm going to jump into a project to show you some of these features. It actually comes to us from an online documentary series from the Lowrider magazine called Role Models. I can imagine a lot of the people in this room are probably big fans of Lowrider vehicles including Randy Perez, who's in this photo. So he is a retired firefighter from San Jose, standing very proudly then next to his custom 1936 uh, Packard. And he was featured in a recent uh, episode of this web series. Uh, it's notable because it was uh, shot and post-produced by our pro workflow team at Apple. And it was all shot in uh, ProRes RAW. Uh, you can see actually here, this is the Atomos Shogun Inferno, uh, recording ProRes RAW from a variety of uh, cameras. So, without further ado, I'm going to jump over here into my uh, demo system and we'll take a look. This is a, a trailer that was produced to promote the show. So it's about a one and a half minute short. As I said, all in ProRes RAW, all in 4K. So I'm going to just jump back to the beginning and we can take a little look at the project. football game one time in high school, one of the more popular guys, he had a 65 Apollo. And just the way he negotiated and had the car go over the speed bump, it just looked like poetry in motion to me. It's just like, oh man, I can't wait till I get my first car. It's going to be a loader. I just can't wait. And there he is in his car. So, uh, as I mentioned in the introduction, what was interesting about this project is we shot on a variety of cameras, or it was shot on a variety of cameras, including uh, Panasonic EVA1, uh, Sony FS5, and also uh, the Canon C300. And the other camera that they used to shoot some of this footage was actually a drone. So you may have noticed when we announced ProRes RAW, we announced that uh, DJI's higher-end higher drone, the Inspire, actually has an option to support 6K ProRes RAW recording right on the drone. So I have some of that footage here. This is actually log. Um, so this is actually one of those 6K shots. I'm going to use this in my project. I'm going to um, drop it down into my timeline. 
Any of you that have worked with log will notice straight away that it looks kind of washed out to the eye. That's the way that uh, log encoded footage looks before it's adjusted. Um, and what's interesting about uh, the DJI drone is that they have their own flavor of log. They call it D-log, right? Most of the cameras have their own uh, flavor of log. And so what I'm looking at here is basically uh, taking that raw footage and displaying it in that D-log flavor. But to get it into the working color space, right? On the, in this case, in the timeline, I'm uh, in a Rec. 709 SDR timeline. I need to apply a camera LUT. And so you can see I have a field here called camera LUT. So we have a bunch of built-in LUTs, including some of those uh, that work with some of the popular cameras. But I can also add a custom camera LUT, right? So I've just imported this uh, Mavic Pro D-Log. And you'll notice when I go ahead and apply it, now my footage is in the color space on the timer. Now it's very important to note, nothing's being rendered, nothing's being burned in. It's just actually just doing a mathematic uh, transformation. Uh, so of course it's not going to slow anything down, it's not going to uh, end up having to go back and sort of unpick it because the log footage is still there underneath and of course it's super quick. So there's my, uh, there's my uh, 6K drone clip. Let's just go ahead and I'm just going to position it where I want it in the timeline. And I'm just going to drop it down. Now, the other thing that's really nice, really interesting actually, about shooting 6K is here I'm working in a 4K project. Um, if I want to start pushing in on some of my shots, because it's 6K, I, I can push in and still have all of the pixels there, because I have all these extra pixels to work with. So a good example of that is here in this shot. This is kind of a cool shot of the car going over a bridge. It's a little bit sort of distant. I want to push in a little bit. And so if you work out the mathematics of this, uh, if I scale this up to something up to about 170%, I can do it without uh, essentially just using the pixels that are in that 6K footage. So it's going to remain nice and crisp, nice and sharp. I'm not getting any artifacts. So again, just a nice uh, little extra advantage to having that, that extra res resolution to play with. So the next thing I want to do, and this is often the case when you're shooting with multiple cameras, every camera has its kind of distinct characteristics and maybe shot in different light and so forth. And so you want to be able to go through your timeline and sort of match things, right? Maybe not exactly, but just get it to look, uh, you know, the same to, to the eye for people viewing. So this is a great use of the new comparison viewer. So let's open it up and take a look. Um, I've just opened up the comparison viewer on the left-hand side here. You'll notice one really nice feature is uh, you can add the scopes to the bottom of the viewer. So there on the left-hand side, if I do the same over here in my viewer, I can bring my scopes up side by side, of course, customized however I like. And I'm starting off up here. It's in this timeline mode. So what that means is um, I can just press on these little buttons underneath here in the comparison viewer and just jump backwards and forwards between the two clips that are sitting next to the one that I just added. So the first thing I want to do with my clip is I just want to do a basic uh, contrast adjustment. You can see on the left, it's much you know, um, con more contrast range there. The, the, the blacks are a little uh, deeper. So I'm just going to go ahead and select my clip. I'm going to bring up the nice color wheels. Of course, we introduced those in 10.4, as Judd mentioned. Um, and let's just keep an eye on the scopes here and do a little contrast adjustment. So I want to push up the highlights a little bit. Uh, I think I want to brighten the midtones, but then I'm going to drop the shadows down and create a nice uh, bit of contrast. And you see, just like that, with that one little change, what a big difference it makes. And I can keep an eye on the left for my surrounding shots to see that they're, uh, they're working well together. So that's a good first step. The next challenge, of course, this is a show about the car. The car needs to be consistent in these shots. And in particular, if you look at the, uh, the car on the left, the color isn't uh, quite matching between these two different cameras. So to help me with that, I'm going to jump up here. And there's another little button up here that says Saved. So what I can do is, from any stock library, perhaps I have some stock footage, or maybe I want to grab some frames for my project, I can save them right here in this frame browser and then bring them up on the left-hand side in my comparison viewer to do a comparison. So one of the things that I've added here is they took some really nice still photos on location. They took this great photo of the car, which is really a nice reference for the color. So I'm going to choose that as my reference over here in the uh, comparison viewer. And uh, we use some of those uh, really nice hue saturation curves in our advanced color correction tools to get a nice match. It was a little bit uh, fiddly. So just to speed things up a bit today, what I've done is I've saved those, uh, I've saved those adjustments uh, as an effect. 
So to add them, I can just jump down here, add my effect, and you'll see over here, these are all the curves that we added. And you can see how now that's a much better job. So that's looking pretty good. I might just do one extra thing here. This, this green area in the, in the shot is looking a little yellow. So if I choose a point uh, somewhere over here, you'll notice in my hue versus hue curve, it'll give me that, that yellow part of the image. And I'm just going to greenify it. Is that a word? I'm going to add, I'm going to make it greener, a little more lush, right? So I'm just going to drop that down a little bit. And you'll see just in the space of those two adjustments, colors looking much better, contrast, and we're getting a much nicer looking green uh, there on the trees. Let's just play that back and take a look at it. I was at a uh, football game one time in high school, one of the more popular guys, yeah, that's 65 Impala. Okay, next. I mentioned in the introduction that we have an all new uh, video noise reduction filter. So let's take a look at how that works. This shot's actually a good example of this. So if I come into this shot and I move in a little bit here, zoom it in a little bit, you'll see just by looking at it, you can see it's actually quite a noisy shot, right? It's just the way it's been captured. And you can see it particularly in the, in the dark areas of the image. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open up my inspector. I've actually applied the noise reduction filter here. It's disabled at the moment. So this is just built in, right? Just search for noise reduction in the, in the effects browser and you'll find it. Uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and enable it. And you'll notice it will uh, process for a little bit. And just like that, it's applied some reduction. In fact, you can see before and after, just with that starting point, it's already done a pretty good job. Now remember, it is a very processor intensive operation. So we have done quite a bit of work with this noise reduction filter to take full advantage of the performance uh, of the hardware and also within Final Cut Pro to, uh, to make that as efficient as possible. So this is a very noisy shot. Um, I have, and uh, just like Michael Cherney was saying, from the, uh, from the visual side, of course, we just like sliders and easy drop downs. This is a prime example because we have an amount setting that has four settings, right? So you can have a low amount of, of noise reduction up to a, a maximum amount. And because this is quite a noisy shot, I'm gonna actually set it to maximum just to really show you what it can do. You can see it's processing. Um, and then there's another setting here we call sharpness. So sometimes when you apply video noise reduction, it can blur the image a bit. In this case, uh, because it, this was kind of a blurry image to start with, it was kind of shot um, for, you know, uh, as the car's moving very quickly. I probably don't need to do much with that. I might just set this to very low. And let's zoom back out. And you can see there is my 65 Impala, and just the way he negotiated noise reduced clip. Very, very easy to use um, and works, works really well. Okay, so um, I'm gonna move along a little bit here and I know that I've been working on uh, some temporary graphics and I know it's around uh, 35 seconds into my project. Um, perhaps I'm working with someone else. Perhaps we're trying to look, uh, they're trying to look over my shoulder at the time code location. So I feel this is a perfect use case for the new large time code window. So let's jump up into our window menu. You see here I have an option to do project time code. And there it is. So I can move this around. I can position it wherever I like. I can make it smaller, bigger, however I want. And now you will no longer have to sit with your director or your producer, whoever you're working with, them saying, take me to time code, blah, blah, blah. That's not the right time code. And now you can bring up the large time code window and say, yes, it is. It's right there. You can see from the back of the room. All right. So <laughs> I know where I'm going. Uh, it's about 35. Let's just position it where I want it to be. And actually, at this point in the timeline, uh, I've just mocked up a really kind of rough graphic here, right, motion graphic. I want to bring in a couple of clips, do something a little bit more visually interesting. But I want to work with someone outside to make a better version of this. And in fact, when we first built this project, we got uh, Dylan Higginbotham at uh, Stupid Raisins. Some of you guys may know his plugins. He does some really excellent motion templates um, to, to, uh, to make a custom template for us. <laughs> but of course, to do that, he needs uh, all of the source elements, and he needs to know in those source clips where the in points are so he can get just the right parts. So to help me with that, I'm going to bring up the source time code window. So the source time code window, as the name suggests, is showing me at this point in the timeline all of the source clips. What's also nice, you can see I've got my role information and I also have colors, right? So the colors correspond to the roles. My dialogue's blue, my sound effects are that teal color 
got the music green underneath, which is a nice visual reference. All right, so I want to send him my time code locations. I don't really need the roles, so I can just customize my view here. I'm just going to turn off clip roles. And I'm going to go ahead and copy all of that information. And I'm going to jump over here into my messages. And here I have my uh, message for Dylan set up. I'm going to just paste in my sources and my time code starting points. And he only needs to know the video, doesn't need to know the audio files. Mm -hmm. So now, now he knows where to, uh, to mark the edit points. The next thing he needs, of course, is he needs those source clips themselves. So I have up here, I have some beauty shots, which I were basically the sources for this graphic. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and select the ranges that he needs. And I'm going to use that new batch share feature that I talked about in the introduction. So with those clips selected, I'm going to jump over here to my master file export. And you'll see. It's now sharing just those three clips, in fact, the ranges I selected on those three, three clips, in a single export operation, which is really nice. So in addition to being able to get stuff directly out of the browser, I can send multiple clips at once. I probably want to send this as 4x4 four four for graphics. Send it off, ready to go. All right. So I've sent it off. He's worked on this new motion graphic, and he sent it back to me, and here it is, right? So that's looking much better than my uh, rather basic effort. So I'm going to grab this. I'm going to drop it back into my project where it needs to go. Let's just trim it back a little bit so it's uh, uh, sitting in the right place. And what's really nice about this is because um, Dylan knows how to build a motion template, in addition to sending me the graphic, he's also sent me a rig, right? And a rig has some parameters that I can adjust. So rather than having to go backwards and forwards with him, I can try things out myself. So I might want to perhaps change the style of the line here. He has this nice chevron style, makes it look a bit more dynamic. Um, I might want to change the color of the line. So I can just choose this eyedropper, set it to that nice red color on the hubcap. And now, just like that, I have a much more polished graphic. I grew up poor when first of the bike. Looking great. <laughs> and ma many thanks. Many thanks to Dylan for that as well. He did, a, he did a great job. OK, so we've been working on the project. We're getting close to exporting. And as I know, I'm sure the same thing happens for you guys. When you get close to exporting, your mind turns to closed captioning, right? Uh, and we're finding more and more. <laughs> See, it's true. We're finding more and more, of course, it's important to do closed captioning for accessibility, also for delivering stuff on the web nowadays. It's kind of uh, expected. Um, it can be a bit of a drag to do it by hand. Wouldn't it be great if we could generate some captions automatically? So to help us with that, I'm actually going to show you a new workflow extension. Right. So we talked about workflow extensions in the introduction. Um, I'm going to show a workflow extension that comes from the, the, the people at uh, Simon Says. So some of you may have had some experience with Simon Says. They have a great transcription, automatic transcription and translation service that runs on the web. And now they've taken all of that great functionality and put it into a workflow extension right here in Final Cut Pro 10. So the nice thing about workflow extensions, I don't have to jump between apps. I can work with it just in its own little window here right within Final Cut. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump over into my library here. One of the things I needed to do to get a nice caption translation is I need to just have the dialogue, right? So I've created uh, a little render here, a little H.264 that has. I was at a uh, football game one time. Just my dialogue, right? I'm going to grab the event that holds that uh, project, and I'm going to drag and drop it over here into this new project in Simon Says. Super quick. And what it's doing is it's taking that clip in the project, and it's uh, analyzing that audio, and it's automatically creating a caption for me. So what I'm going to do now is, now that it's uploaded, uh, I'm going to go ahead and say, I want to transcribe this. And I'll say, let's do this. So now in the background, it's taking my audio and it's creating that, um, uh, that information. In this case, uh, the information I'm going to use for my caption. So I'll let that chug away. Just to speed things up a little bit, uh, I managed to do that earlier. You can see this one's actually reporting that it's being transcribed, right? So we have that English transcription. Now I have some really great export options. This gets really interesting, right? So I have my English uh, version, but very often you want to be able to subtitle a caption in multiple languages. And what's great about uh, Simon Says here in the extension is 
I can actually get it to do language translation as well. So let's select language translation. I get this huge long list, right? 50 odd different languages I can translate into. Uh, so I'm gonna keep it simple. I'm gonna do French and German. Just press next as before I say, go ahead and do that for me. And just like we did before, what it's doing is now you can see it's taking our English version and it's automatically creating a French and a German version for us. And look how quick that was, right? It's already done. So that's ready to go. I'm gonna hit my export again. This time I wanna take my captions, the new captions that I've created using that service and bring it back into Final Cut. So I'm gonna say I want the captions. It gives me this little drag and drop uh, icon. I just drag and drop it back into my event. I'm gonna keep my original just in case I wanna go back to my pre-captioned version. And now, look at this. So now, I have three sets of captions, and I'm just gonna play this first clip. It's not 100% perfect, but it does an amazingly good job, even in a single pass like that. So if I play this back. I was at a football game one time in high school, one of the more popular guys, he had a 65 Impala, and just the way he negotiated and had the car go over the speed bump, it just looked like poetry in motion to me. It's just like. That is straight off the surface. In fact, I did that live on stage. So that's literally what it's done. It's amazing. And of course, I have my different languages. So I want to do French, no problem. There's my French, right? I want to do German, no problem. There's my German. All done for me automatically. So that's a huge time saver. And it's really great to have it right here in an extension. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy our captions that we created on that export. I'm gonna jump back into the project we were just working on, and I'm gonna add them uh, into my project. Uh, now, a couple of other things. I mentioned in the introduction, we now support the SRT format. So I have another caption file I wanna add uh, that actually was done by an external translator, right, so manually, and they created a caption file for me using SRT. So you'll see, just like importing any other captions, I can now just select an SRT source, SRT here, this is going to be Spanish, so I'll set the language to Spanish, import that, right? So now I have my SRT captions. Um, and I also created earlier some 608 captions here as well, just because for embedded on the TV, or if you're broadcasting, the standard is 608. All right, lots of captions. What's really nice now is when I go to export, I'm going to come up here into my master file export to export my final version. I'm going to go over into my roles, and you'll see that I get some caption options, right? So I can choose to embed the 608. So I have a 608 caption track. I'm going to put that in. And I can also choose which of my languages, in this case, so I've got all my different captions uh, that I added, I want to burn in. So this is going to burn that in so it's always visible on the video when it plays back. And of course, I could do one version for each language and just send it off as an export uh, batch all at once. In this case, I'm just going to do the English. I could go ahead and send that out, but I've already done that. So let's go and have a look at the final version with burn in, right? So you'll see this is burnt in. It's great for social media where sometimes clips can play silently uh, before people hear them, so the captions are already always there. And I'm just going to play this little bit back. It's part of our creativity, right? Our, our Latinoism, our, our raza, to express ourselves creatively, and we do it through our vehicles and through our cars. I try to share with people to let them see that, that there's a whole other part of low writing. A quick look at some of the new features um, in our last big release. And I did want to talk a little bit more about workflow extensions because this is obviously a really big feature that we've introduced. Uh, one of the great things about workflow extensions is uh, it has an open architecture, which means a lot of the third parties that we've been working with over time can now build that functionality into a workflow extension directly in Final Cut. So we have some other partners other than uh, Simon Says. We have Shutterstock. Some of you guys may have used Shutterstock stock footage, really nice, high quality uh, stock, and they have a really great uh, workflow extension. And Frame.io, right? I'm sure many of you have heard of Frame.io. It's fantastic. <laughs> It's a fantastic collaboration, review, and approval uh, application. It has a great web interface, but they've now taken that functionality and built it directly into a workflow extension in Final Cut Pro 10, which means you get a native experience in the app. You don't have to swap uh, between the browser and Final Cut Pro. You can drag and drop assets. And of course, 
who still work in their web client on an iPad, for example, here on iPad Pro, and they have an award-winning iPhone app for doing this stuff on the go with an iPhone. It's really amazing. So, without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce my colleague Estelle and the CEO of Frame.io, Emery Wells, to tell you more about this great work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So it's great to be here with you, Emery. Thank you, Estelle. Thrilled to be here in LA at the Creative Pro User Group. And I'm super excited to show all of you our new workflow extension for Final Cut Pro. For those of you who may be unfamiliar, Frame.io is the world's most popular video review and collaboration platform. So we're going to show you a video that the Frame.io team created for the launch of our new workflow extension. It was shot in ProRes RAW, and of course, it was edited, graded, and finished in Final Cut Pro. We actually used our own workflow extension to collaborate with a group of creatives that were distributed all around the world and with the team at Apple in Cupertino. So we're going to show you the beginning of the video, and then we're going to get into how it was created using workflow extensions. Alright, so let's get into how it was created. So this new icon that you see in the upper left is where you'll access all of your installed workflow extensions. And the first thing you'll notice when you launch the Frame.io workflow extension is it's a design that feels very familiar to Final Cut Pro users. It was written in Swift from the ground up, which means you're going to get the native desktop performance you'd expect on your Mac. That means beautiful scrolling, skimming, quick look, and JKL playback performance. Now, the project that Estelle has open here is the base level of organization in Frame.io. It's where you upload all your media, set everything up, and add all your collaborators. So as you saw in Luke's demonstration and right here, you can have your extension window just floating above your UI. Now, if you have a second display, you can have it full screen on that second display as well, which is a great way to work. But for this instance, I actually saved a layout, a workspace layout, for my workflow extension using Frame.io. So conveniently anchoring it at the side there. Now the first window I'm going to open is my player view. And the player view allows you to see a clip or a project in this case. And it's where all of the major collaboration occurs. So you can see a little line of collaborators right here. We've got a number of their comments underneath. And I can see some other options as well. So for example, this has been tagged as needs review when I uploaded it. In fact, I'm going to change that to in progress so that no one bothers us while we're working, Emery. Very good. And you'll also notice that there are a number of different versions as well. It's really easy to do versioning inside of Frame.io. And this little notification right here um, allows you to see as you're working new notifications pop up. So what I love about this is the ability to be able to click directly on any of these comments and my player view takes me directly to that comment. But my favorite feature is the ability to be able to link playheads between Final Cut Pro and the extension and that means no matter where I go within the player view or Final Cut Pro, my player follows. You can see how beneficial this would be if you were working with a distributed team that's exchanging notes and comments, or even with a team in the same office. On this project, which was the real project that we did for the launch of the workflow extension, we were working with a motion graphics artist who was in London, and the rest of the team was spread out throughout the US and Canada. So the first comment I'm going to address is this one right here. Judd wants us to change the color of the X to purple, and I don't need to have a list of notes um, on paper to know exactly what he's referring to. It goes directly to that frame. Now, a motion graphics artist who was located in London 
gave me the benefit of publishing all of these parameters, just like Luke mentioned before, working with motion templates, you can have rigs with published parameters, enabling an editor to have easy access to a few of the things that you might want to change within an edit. And the color of this graphic was one of them, so I'll quickly change that. And now that I've addressed that note, I can mark that as completed. The note that I'm going to address is from Andrew. So Andrew was a motion graphic artist that was in Canada, and he was doing all of the screen recording motion graphics in this piece. So I had a number of back plates that we had recorded, and he needed me to get them to him quite quickly. So because we've set up missions for this folder right here, which is going to our motion graphics artist, it's named two graphics, then I can really quickly just drag these options, these clips, directly to Andrew's folder. And because Andrew was already added to this project, he'll get a notification so he can uh, download those shots and start working on his comp. So I'll just return to the player view here and we can get started addressing some additional notes. So, you know, actually, it looks like Luke and Judd have jumped in and started reviewing. Why don't we make it larger so we can get a better view? So with our, our new presence feature, we can actually see when someone is watching and even where they're watching in real time. <laughs> and just like in applications like Messages, you can even see when someone is typing. So this makes the collaboration experience feel really alive. You know, I think I actually want to join this review party, which I'm going to do from the Frame.io iPhone app. Luke and Judd are also on iPhones in the audience. Estelle is in the workflow extension in Final Cut Pro, and of course, this works great from Safari. So within the iPhone app, I have all the same collaboration features. Of course, I can play clips back. I can tap through any of the comments and get taken directly to their frames. But it, it looks like I have a comment from Estelle here. She's, she's asking for some feedback on this color grade. I think it's looking really great, but actually what would make this just a little bit more engaging is if we made the, the talent pop. So, I'm gonna ask her to try a vignette. Can we add a vignette? And I'll even draw right on the video frame to make sure she knows the talent that I'm talking about. <laughs> so this comment's gonna flow right back into the Frame.io workflow extension in Final Cut Pro. So over here, you can see Emery's annotation. It's so helpful that he drew right around the talent because you know it's hard to distinguish like what I should put a vignette around. Thanks, Emery. You're welcome. So I'm just going to double click here, add that vignette. I'll move the center. I think that looks pretty good. What do you reckon? It's a little heavy. It's a little heavy. But you know what? I think what the audience is dying to see is how we can use multiple workflow extensions together. Yes. So let's have a look at one of our other notes that Luke left. He wanted us to use an alternate shot here. So this is one of the drone shots, and we only did two passes around this cliff. So I need to get something from stock footage. I'm going to open up the Shutterstock workflow extension. So as you can see, you can have multiple extensions open at once. And just like all of the benefits of using Shutterstock in a web browser, I have all of my curated collections available to me right here. I'm inside of my account, I can search, and I get the benefit of all of my account options as well, for example, my saved collections. And the Frame.io team had saved a collection of videos for me that they thought we might include in this piece. Now, as I hover over the top of any one of these thumbnails, you'll notice that you get a small amount of metadata displayed against it. Of course, I get the extensive set as I click through. And the benefit of clicking through one of these clips is that any compositionally identical image will actually show me a list of similar videos underneath. So I'm going to import this comp, and faster than I can close the extension itself, it's come into my project. So I'm going to add that to my timeline, and I'm also going to add a licensed version as well. So I'm going to show you what that means to add both of these and then to look at the metadata within the timeline index here. Because if I go through to the tags, what's fantastic about what Shutterstock have done is not only 
do they actually create a library called Shutterstock, but they tag everything as well. So anything that's a preview will be tagged, anything that's licensed is tagged, which is incredibly convenient as you're working through. You can even create an, a role that's dedicated to all of your stock footage. So let's come back and have a look at addressing one of the notes. I can see that there was a notification that was added by Andrew that all of these background plates have now been created into a final composition. So I'm going to go to my From Graphics and download this final graphic. And I get the benefit here, if I'm on, say, low bandwidth or I just don't want to spend the time downloading, I can try something out in a different frame size, or in this case, I'm just going to go with the original. And I'll import that. You'll see a progress right here. And as soon as that's finished, I can drag that either into my library or directly down into my timeline, which is very convenient. And if I just play that back, we can see that Andrew's done a fantastic job there. So as a final step, we're going to want to upload the finished timeline for approval. Earlier, we showed you how you could upload individual shots by dragging and dropping from the event browser into the extension. But when you want to upload an entire timeline, you do that via the Frame.io share destination. So Final Cut will render in the background. It'll automatically upload to Frame.io and fire off a notification to Judd that it's ready for approval. Now, I happen to know that Judd's already approved this video, which is great because we're about to show you the final launch video of the Frame.io workflow extension for Final Cut Pro. So we're really excited about workflow extensions, and you can download this work workflow extension for free from the Mac App Store. And with that, I will hand it back over to Judd. Thank you guys very much.